Yeah, hey now, PASW staff, clients, and friends joining us. It's Wednesday. Happy uh, Wednesday. Um, we're halfway through the week. So far, so good, right? I mean, so far, everything's going okay. Um, we had a lot of fun with the gypsy guitarist Django Reinhardt yesterday, one of the most famous European jazz musicians to come out. Um, you know, Americans are already doing jazz, but he, you know, he's really taking the gypsy guitar, you know, again, with two fingers. It's not easy at all. Um, uh, it's not easy with four fingers, you know? So, and then the film scoring results are in for Amelie. So you guys did a great job. We'll show you that on Friday. Um, we're going to look at a composer that I've always known, but I didn't know anything about. Um, I, just until this last year, I take a walk every day, and usually I try to listen to new stuff that, um, that we can talk about, that I think is important to talk about. There's a lot of stuff that... I give it a lot of thought, and I'm like, eh, this isn't important to talk about with them. But I, I do, I, I really have gotten to like a lot of this guy's music lately. Um, of course, it's way, you know, he's not alive anymore. But he's probably the most famous composer that's come, come out of Scandinavia. He's Finnish. Born, uh, uh, born December 8th. I know another Scandinavian born December 8th. Her name's Bonnie, but I don't think she wants to be... Um, uh, talked about, so we won't talk about her. But um, we're going to look at the really romantic genius composer, Jean Sibelius. Finnish, yeah. So, I mean, we got to get to Finland. I don't know where it is. Let's go. Let's go from Belgium to Finland. And this is where Jean Sibelius is born. He's born in 1865. And so let's get a timeline up here because uh, he's born right when right when Debussy's born. So they're almost, but he lives a long time. He lives till 91 years old. So he dies in 1957. It's weird to think that you're born in the Civil War. You know when the Civil War ends, but then you're seeing Elvis and all these other all this other stuff. So. It's interesting to think of it that way. Uh, I don't know how he lived so long. He smoked and drank so much. I mean, he had to literally move out of Helsinki, like in Finland, and go into a cabin so he wouldn't, uh, you know, be, he, would, he would go on benders for days and they couldn't find him. Uh, it's, it's sad. I mean, it's um, something, you know, it's, but we'll get to that. We'll get to his life. We'll get to uh, a few pieces that I just want to share with you that I think that are just so terrific again because they're melodic there's some really great melodic exciting music coming out and this is at a time when the 20th century decides in the early 20th century at least decides that a melody is not as important and it becomes more of what does the music look like on the paper as opposed to do we like hearing it i know that sounds weird but that's exactly what was going on in classical music in the 20th century with the height of romantic music in the 19th century, I think critics and academics and other composers were just, they, they were tired of it. And I, I've been debating to do a class on Arnold Schoenberg. I, I, I mentioned him because um, I just don't want to put you guys through that. But Schoenberg mostly was responsible for saying, let's get rid of tonality. Even though he was a very tonal composer himself, after being tonal, he said, okay, we're going to go with atonality, which, you know, atonality means not tonal. Atypical means not typical. So you can put an A in front of anything, and it's not, you know, atovar. That means not tovar. Um, so with Schoenberg, he, but Sibelius, of course, is not going to, he's not going to fall for that. So uh, he wants, he's very much in the tradition of composers like Wagner, who is writing, you know, I mean, in the middle of the 19th century, highly romantic German opera, opera music, operatic music, and also Tchaikovsky, who's writing ballets and super romantic music. Um, Tchaikovsky's dead, though, by 1893, so Sibelius is, at that time, still just about to be really famous in uh, Finland and in Europe. So he starts playing violin and piano at age seven or eight, right around there, his uncle is his main teacher, and um, uh, although they they want him to go study law, uh, he, you know music is more of his more of his um, thing. 
So he, he he studies music at the the music institute uh, in Finland, and uh, which is now called the Sibelius Academy. So that's pretty cool to have uh, to go to a school and then they name it after you later. Um, and uh, he starts studying composition. And the first piece that we're going to look at is probably his most famous. It's Finlandia. Finlandia uh, is the unofficial na- national anthem for Finland, and it sounds like a national anthem. It's highly melodic, a lot of brass. So Finlandia is a tone poem. We haven't looked at tone poem. T- tone poem is, is, for the most part, a symphonic work, only in one movement. So symphonies are in multiple movements, usually four or five. You know, I mean, respectfully. Whatever respectfully means. Does that mean with respect? Um, but tone poem is just one one uh, movement that's usually like 10 or 15 minutes long. Strauss and Liszt did tone poems, and we'll, we'll look at those composers. But for right now, Sibelius's tone poem, Finlandia, premieres in 18... Or is done, finished and premiered around 1899 or 1900. They're not sure exactly on the year. So what a, what a um, time period for something to be um, done and finished and premiered by, because I mean, the 20th century has got to be the most amazing century ever be in terms of, um, you know, invention, technology, science, and then music too. So this is, but he's, he's showing a lot of mel- mel- melody in this, in this tone poem. He's not doing with what other composers are doing where they're straying away from melody. He's very bold in it. And maybe that's what upset some people. You know, he's writing, he's highly influenced by nature. He's walking all the time. He's going outside. He, because he's so self-destructive in, in the town, he, he moves into this cabin, which is now the Sibelius Museum, with his wife and daughters, um, to to compose. And it, um, this is where he lives from 1904 to the rest of his life. And, um, and then he... In 1923, he premieres the Sixth Symphony. And the Sixth Symphony is, we're going to look at just, I mean, the first movement, because this is just such an amazing symphony. Um, Sibelius is known for his symphonies, just like Mahler is. Mahler's another composer, that, and they were contemporaries, and they met, actually. And, you know, some composers, just like Wagner, is known for opera. You know, Tchaikovsky ballets. We're simplifying here because we have to. We have to make sense of the world. Um Sibelius and Mahler are known for symphonies. So uh, Sibelius wrote seven, Mahler wrote ten, so Mahler got him beat. Um, But uh, supposedly there was an eighth, but I think he burned it in a drunken rage or something like that. But um, the sixth is so delightful, and um, it it, it is just so um, full of colors and melodies that just burst out. And it makes you want to um, just be in nature and smile. Sibelius is doing in the Sixth Symphony, or in a lot of his music, especially in the later part, is he's taken away formal things in music. So, like sonata form, things that Beethoven and Mozart were writing, even Mahler's writing sonata form, he's not doing that. He's focusing more on themes and developing themes and contrasting themes together. 
and evolving themes. I think that's what was so different to people that, that heard his music. They weren't used to hearing, it wasn't free form, but it was more, it was freer than other composers were writing it. And his use of ostinati. Okay, so ostinato is kind of a repeating rhythm. We looked at ostinato um, and the plurals ostinati with minimalist composers that come out in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, you know, years later. In particular, we did a class on Jan John Adams, if you remember. And if you remember, I said that John Adams, you, you know, he took what Steve Reich and Philip Glass were doing with minimalism, but they were doing it with their ensembles. John Adams said, okay, if they got their ensembles, I'm gonna, I'm gonna use these things, but I'm gonna use, it, use the orchestra as my vehicle. And he was very influenced by Sibelius because Sibelius was doing kind of these patterns in ostinati in his symphonies and um, and using themes in a way that was very different than other composers going on. Um, and it was it came out just sounding so it comes out sounding so fresh and so happy and 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 you know lack of a better word fun. <laughs> So his big thing with the symphonies and his music is themes and developing themes. And that's different. And I think if you're writing symphonies, sure, symphonies have themes in them, but he was using themes in a, in a very, making a grand statement with that, with the themes instead of, um, that was modern, that I think that made somebody like John Adams really like his kind of music. This is just some wonderful music I wanted to share with you on the Finnish composer Jean, Jean Sibelius. Um, it's funny because, it's not funny, but in 1951, while Sibelius was still alive, uh, Rene Leibowitz, I don't know Leibowitz at all, but um, a music theory and, and, you know, music expert, whatever expert means, uh, um, he wrote something, uh, and the title was Sibelius, the worst composer in the world. And that was the name of the title. I mean, it's so hard for artists to do their own thing already. And then when you have um, critics and experts on top of that, um, you know, I mean, it's one thing to not like something, but to actually write something that it's the worst thing. Sibelius, this wasn't a, I don't think this was, maybe this wasn't a retort to that, but he did say, and this is interesting, he did say, pay no attention to what critics say. No statue has ever been put up to a critic. And that's true. So, you know, critics are important for sure, and we're all critical of things. But if we think of the statues that, that have been put up of great thinkers, great artists, I, I don't think there's any critic that's had a statue of them. Um, you know, it's just something to think about. So um, it's the art and the work that's the most important part. Um, so, uh, and they did erect a statue of Sibelius. So, you know, it worked out well for him. Okay, uh, that's uh, Jean Sibelius. Hope you enjoyed it. Some lovely, beautiful music. Go out and take a walk and listen to his music. Um, I will later today. And that means you have to, okay? Um, just kidding. Okay, love you and miss you. And um, tomorrow we're going to go back to L.A. and look at a, a very cool building in my neighborhood, if that's okay. Okay, see you tomorrow. Bye.